Hi, this is Ellie Fishman, and welcome to our latest uh, Facebook Live. Today's Tuesday, and it's 12.30, so let's get started. And um, when I was trying to, when Rachel asked me yesterday what topic we should choose, I was actually somewhat at a loss trying to think of what we had discussed or what we should discuss, but I thought perhaps we would talk about renal tumors and about renal imaging. So that's what we'll talk about today. And um, again, as usual, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions anybody has. So if you have any questions, just ask them as we go along. So I think one of the challenges uh, in CT in general is always this balance between acquisitions and information. And we know that when you look at the kidney, if radiation wasn't a dose, uh, dose issue, you would get four acquisitions. You'd basically get a non-contrast scan, arterial phase, which is about 30 to 40 seconds post-injection or initiation of injection, a venous phase, which is about 60 to 70 seconds, and an excretory phase, which is perhaps four or five minutes post-injection. Now, the thing about those phases is that, you know, many of you have a lot of experience like I do, is that there's no one perfect phase for detecting every single cancer. Um, we know that if you want to be not only detecting lesions, but also classifying lesions, you need a number of phases. And again, we do our protocols differently. I won't do protocols exactly today. We do our protocols such that we have less phases in younger patients and more phases in older patients. But if you think about the issues with the kidney, there's several. One is lesion detection. Okay, that's fine. You have to detect something to figure out what it is. But the second thing, of course, is lesion classification. There's been many articles written that show that 25% of renal masses that are resected are actually benign. So 25% of patients have lesions that did not need surgery. Now, sometimes, you know, in retrospect, you can figure out, boy, I didn't see the fat, and this was a myelopoma, or sometimes this may be a oncocytoma when doing some nuclear studies to prove that. But it's this categorization uh, of patients that indeed becomes very important. So let's look at the things that, when we talk about phases, how we think about tumors. So what about non-contrast CT? In general, we like to say non-contrast CT is good for renal stones. It's good for high resolution of the chest, lungs. But in the abdomen, we don't routinely do non-contrast CTs. We don't do non-contrast CTs for looking at the liver, and we don't do non-contrast CTs for looking at the pancreas or the spleen or the bowel. Really, the times we do non-contrast and then follow up by contrast is in patients with suspected renal masses or hematuria. And what is the non-contrast scan going to give you? Of course, it can tell you the presence of stone disease, though if I'm careful, arterial face imaging can also show me stones, except for maybe the tiniest of stones. But what the non-contrast does get you is a lesion's density. So if you see a lesion, let's say we have a three centimeter mass, that's about three centimeters, four centimeters. Before I look at the contrast phases, I like to think about looking at the lesion as well defined, sharply marginated. Could be a renal cell, but without looking, could be a high density cyst, could be a simple cyst, could be an angiomyelopoma. So when you look at the non-contrast, you're looking at the borders with the density. And so what happens is, if a lesion measures under 20 Hounsfield units, or over 70 Hounsfield units, under 20, over 70, well-defined, then that lesion is always going to be benign. A cyst, a myelipoma, angiomyelipoma, or perhaps a high-density cyst. And of course, one of the reasons we love non-contrast is because you can have a high-density cyst, which measures 80 Hounsfield units, but if you only have one phase, it looks solid, and you're going to call it a tumor. But this spread... Under 20, over 70, benign, walk away. Uh, most renal cancers, if you measure them on, on a density value, are going to be around 37 Hounsfield units non-contrast. So the non-contrast helps me get rid of those patients who you sent to surgery because you sent them from a high-density renal cyst or some other benign process. Now, we also need to look carefully at non-contrast for the presence of fat. Everyone knows what an angiomyelipoma looks like. It's a lot of fat. But it's important to remember that angiomyelipomas may only have minimal fat. And when they have minimal fat, it's very easy to miss. They may have just a few pixels of fat. Angiomyelipomas range from 100% fat to 1% or 2% fat. 
The ones with minimal fat are very difficult to diagnose, but those are the ones you can save a kidney on. Now, not everything that has fat you're going to say is a myelipoma. You can have renal cell carcinoma with fat, but honestly, the patients with renal cells with fat are big, ugly, aggressive tumors that invade the perirenal fat. And it may contain fat, but it's by extension. When you just see little foci of fat, I once saw a case of Wilms tumor, but the mass looks really ugly. It's very vascular. AMLs with minimal fat, you can make that diagnosis and save the patient a nephrectomy. Arterial phase. Now, people will say, well, arterial phase, maybe it's too early. What's the pros and cons? Arterial phase, we do a lot of 3D mapping. Renal artery mapping, the vascularity of tumors, and so much now is being talked about in using CT vascularity for predicting response to agents like tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So the importance of being able to get the vascularity, see the AV shunting, do some type of quantitative measurements of neovascularity are all things that are becoming important. I also like to be have that early phase because very vascular lesions, I know a clear cell, which is 80%, 85% of tumors, and hypovascular, which means it enhances, but under 90 is going to be uh, a papillary renal cell carcinoma. That's very important. Obviously, papillary is slow growing, an older patient. Under two centimeters, people are often simply following papillary. Clear cell, if you're on the fence, you might be more aggressive and resected doing a partial nephrectomy. So it's important to be able to understand and be able to report not just there's a mass present, but there's a papillary or a clear cell. And I think we're right probably 95% of the time. You can't just go by size. You know, in your mind, you want to say bigger is clear cell, smaller is papillary. But I've seen some big papillaries, and I've seen some small clear cells. But the value, the enhancement, really becomes very valuable. So that's one thing. So I like that arterial phase, looking at the neovascularity. So that's 30-ish seconds. Now we're at 60 to 70 seconds. Now, one type of tumor that can be missed on arterial phase imaging are very small tumors that are vascular at the cortical medullary interface, then they kind of get blurred. And some of those tumors are best seen on the venous or the excretory phase imaging. Once you have the washout, they're easy to see. Now, I have seen tumors that sometimes are only seen arterial, and they became essentially isodense later. The same thing with the venous. I'm, typically, I've never seen a tumor that's only seen on venous for 60 to 70 seconds, nephrographic, whatever you want to call it. If I see it there, I will see it on the arterial, or I will see it on the delayed. The main reason for that scan is 60 to 70 seconds is to look at the veins. Arterial phase is too early, delayed phase is too late, 60 to 70 seconds or even up to 90 seconds. Gives you a good look at the renal veins. There's no flow-related artifact. Gives you a good look at the IVC. So you're much better at looking at the presence of clot or, in fact, the absence of clot or invasion. Too early and too late are going to be problematic. So you really don't want to go there. So that becomes very, very important in terms of determining the phases. Um, and finally, you do excretory phase. So what's the story with excretory phase? Well, the first thing is, if you have transitional cell carcinomas, and I'm going to give a talk, I think I'm going to record it tomorrow on transitional cell. If you have a transitional cells, they're usually hypovascular. Sometimes you don't see them on the arterial and venous phase, or you're not certain if you see them, excretory phase becomes very obvious. Narrowing of the calyces, uh, narrowing of the ureter, all of those things are best seen on the excretory phase imaging or late phase imaging. So in that regard, I like the late phases for looking for TCC. Uh, sometimes, you know, you, you have a finding early and it becomes isodense on the uh, late phase, but usually that's not a tumor. It's usually going to be something benign, uh, but that late phase is wonderful for TCC. One of the things we always talk about is that how smaller TCCs are missed, and they're typically missed in part. You don't see the perfusion changes early. But later on, what happens, if the, you know, if you have a big TCC, it distorts the renal pelvis or the calyces, it's one thing. But sometimes it just strictures the calyx, very subtle. Those are best seen on excretory phase imaging, may only be seen on excretory phase imaging. And what I do is I use MIP imaging. 
I think it's really good to use MIP on the excretory phase and look for changes in the pelvis or the calyces. Uh, MIP imaging is stupendous for detecting small TCCs that way. It's also stupendous for detecting papillary necrosis, which is another day's topic. But papillary necrosis, when you look at axial images or even coronal, it's a lot of beam hardening at the edge of the calyces from the contrast. But when you do the MIP imaging, you get rid of all of that, and you can see that golf T appearance with the uh, T in the ring of papillary necrosis. So let's let's see. Uh, let me look uh, where I have one kidney only, and now an inoperable tumor that is not treatable by normal methods. What do you suggest? Um, well, we're at Hopkins, you know, and there's a lot of good places. So I think uh, there are a lot of uh, different ways of doing things as new chemotherapies. Also, uh, some surgeons are very skilled at doing partial nephrectomy. So I recommend you 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 know you see a surgeon. Who, a urologist who's really good at partial nephrectomies. A lot of the big cancer centers at Hopkins, we have many good people. Dr. Olive is one of them who are really good at partial nephrectomies. There are many outstanding urologists around the country. So uh, obviously we don't see your case, and sometimes you can't get a partial nephrectomy, and there's different therapies for patients, including nephrectomy and then patients going on dialysis. But it will surely depend on the case, the images, and the extent of disease. So I don't want to be prescribing, but I think if you haven't seen a urologist yet, or you haven't seen someone who's a really oncologic urologist, it may be in your best interest to do that. And at least if they can't do anything, you'll know what the next steps are, what needs to be done. There's new chemotherapies. There's a lot of new opportunity. So that's uh, that becomes an important thing. So I would definitely do that. Um, one of the things I think also since we're mentioning a patient and we're mentioning a surgeon, uh, it's very important to work with urologists. Uh, for example, at Hopkins, we have uh, some urologists. Uh, we have a lot of really outstanding urologists. That's the first thing. The Department of Urology at Hopkins, the Brady Institute, has been state-of-the-art for, for 100 years probably. Um, one of the things about it is that surgeons will have different expertises in partial nephrectomies, uh, we do have a clinic here that simply follows small tumors. Remember, the ACR appropriateness criteria for older patients under 1 cm, just follow it. Most of them are papillary, they grow slow or not at all. Uh, that's something to think about. Also, in older patients, if you have what looks like a papillary tumor, it may not metastasize during your lifetime, so it may seem to be a lot of work to do a nephrectomy or partial nephrectomy for something that's not going to impact you. It could perhaps then lead to, to uh, problems with renal function and the need for dialysis. So, again, surgery is not always going to be the answer for people. There are new chemotherapies that are coming along. Some of them are indeed very successful. There's new immunotherapy. So there's a lot of things coming along, and I think that part indeed is very exciting. Uh, it's a matter literally of you know understanding your case, understanding the DNA of your tumor, and then going from there. So I think that becomes important, but again, working with urologists is important, and I always say the same thing is my career and my expertise is based on working with the referring docs. We need to know what they want to know and what they want to answer. We also need to know, you know, what information they need. So with kidneys, we do a lot of 3D imaging so they can plan partial nephrectomies. We work very closely in terms of looking at vascularity of lesions, looking at changes over time in the chest, abdomen, or pelvis. So those are all things that become very important. Um, with the four phases, again, the key thing for us is detection and classification. So between the early phases, I'll detect the tumor, and the venous and delayed will help me classify. And yes, I can classify tumors very commonly on the arterial phase. Based on its vascularity, you give me a very vascular lesion, I know it's a clear cell. But the other phases do indeed help, particularly on lesions which are vascular and become hidden in the cortex and arterial phase, and are very well seen on expiratory phase imaging particularly. So that's something indeed to think of. So when you do these protocols, it's important to have three or four protocols built into your scanner, depending on age, depending on microscopic versus macroscopic hematuria. I've mentioned that before, microscopic hematuria the chance of a tumor is relatively low compared to macroscopic hematuria, which basically says there must be a tumor present. So 
we think about all of those things. Um, again, just from a practical perspective, we inject 100 to 120 cc's, four to five cc's a second. Five cc's is ideal. We do the phases we need based on the clinical history, based on the patient's age. Uh, and so that becomes a very important part of what we do. Uh, kidney imaging in any big imaging center or hospital like Hopkins is a very important part of what we do. Uh, CT is excellent for detection and staging of renal masses. It's also excellent for doing follow-up. Once patients have had surgery, what happens? We see lots of people with pancreatic metastasis. We, we, you, know, the, you, know, you really need to think about uh, if you're doing a follow-up patient who had uh, renal cell carcinoma, what phases do you need? Again, clear cell, multiple phases because the meds are vascular. So one of the things we like to think about in looking at the kidneys is really why are we doing the study? What are the questions we need to answer? What does the urologist need to know? And what's best for our patients? And then we use all that information and then we come up with hopefully the best protocol. So with that, um, is a, I'm gonna be doing a few talks on the kidney on CTSS, on a lecture series, um, and hopefully we'll be recording them this week so you'll be seeing them within the next month. And if no one has any further questions, we've used up our time. And we'll see you again next time. And have a great day.